Hey everyone, I'm Eric from Curbside Cycle, and today we're going to talk about winter cycling. So a lot of people tend to think that once September comes around, it's best to put your bike into the garage. We'd like to say you should ride it just a little bit longer. So at Curbside, we import European city bikes, and we'd also like to think that we also import European cycling culture. And one aspect of European cycling culture is biking all winter. So it's long been the assumption in North America that if you are a winter cyclist, you're really geared up almost for battle. You're wearing spandex tights, clip-in shoes, bright yellow jackets, and it requires this whole disassembly when you get to the office, a shower, and a complete rechange of wardrobe. And to us, that's just really crazy. If you go to Europe, everyone's wearing exactly what they normally wear in the winter. The difference is they're on their bike. Imagine not cooping yourself up into a bus or a car and actually being out there in the winter, not having to change your entire outfit for that purpose. It's just you and your bike experiencing the chill in the air, rose on your cheeks, scarf flying behind you. It's a beautiful thing. So now winter does require special gear and it's worth getting into that. So in the presentation to follow, we're gonna talk a lot more about the bike you have rather than the clothing you're wearing. We're just gonna assume that whatever winter clothing you're already wearing is perfect for winter cycling. Being a pedestrian and being a cyclist, it's really not all that different. So let's begin with the bike itself. So a lot of people will use a beater bike in the winter, which is basically a bike that's kind of near death. And that's okay, that's a tactic that can work. The other option is to get an actual bike designed for winter. And the cool thing about a bike designed for winter is that it's truly a bike designed for all season, which means it works great in winter, but it also works equally well in the summer. It's a year round bicycle. What does that look like? So if you're looking for the perfect all season bike, it really begins with the frame material. So bikes are typically made of three different frame materials. One is steel, one is aluminum, and now and then you're gonna see carbon fiber as well. Now most city bikes are made out of steel or aluminum, and it's important to sort of drill down into the advantages and disadvantages of each. Steel is the stronger of the two material. It tends to be used in a lot of city bikes for that reason. But the problem with steel is that it can rust. And because it can rust, it's really, really important that the finishes on steel, by finishes we mean the undercoat and the top coat, that those are treated with the same sort of structural integrity as the frame itself. The pink kind of finish you're looking for is something called a powder coat. Powder coating is where they actually magnetize the frame with one charge and they have another charge in the paint and it creates this adhesive bond that will actually mold to dents that happen in the frame. So chips are very unlikely. Underneath that powder coat, there'll be an undercoat which is a rust resistant undercoat. Now, the other option in terms of materials is aluminum. And aluminum is great because it cannot rust. It just simply can't. But the disadvantages with the aluminum is that it's not as quite as strong as steel. It's about 30% less strong. And that means that you need to be careful when locking up this bike, especially when you're locking it up to a metal pole. It can dent a little bit easier. And if it dents, the frame is in fact destroyed. So the finishes on aluminum don't matter quite as much. They matter a lot more on steel. And of course, as we always like to say, whenever you do get a chip on a bike, just take some clear nail polish because that stuff is really strong and just dab it over the chip. Now it will prevent it from rusting or further exposure to corrosion. The other almost essential thing that makes an all season bike an all season bike is the drivetrain. And by drivetrain, we mean basically your shifting assembly. So your, your gears on the bike. Now gears on most North American bikes use something called a derailleur. And a derailleur is this device that literally derails the chain. The, the chain goes up and down the cogs in the back and sometimes also up and down the cogs in the front. And it's a great system if you want something very lightweight and something that offers a ton of gear range. But what it doesn't do is promise any form of low maintenance whatsoever. Derailleurs are systems that tend to be very finicky when it comes to gear adjustments. They tend to go out of gear adjustment quite often. And of course, because they're totally exposed to the elements, they can seize up in snow and get clogged up by slush, just generally not sort of tucked under the hood, as it were. Now, an internal gear hub is an amazing invention. In fact, it was an invention designed almost specifically for city bikes. You'll see internal gubs, <laughs> gubs. You'll see internal gear hubs used almost exclusively on all bikes in Northern Europe that are used as transportation. So the advantage with internal gear hubs is that they're sealed. The gears are completely inside the hub. That means salt, snow, slush, water, totally sealed. So a good case of a derailleur doing its best work is when you're doing a long, long, long ride and you get a slight change in like a hill or some sort of topography or 
maybe the wind changes and you can just make this little small gear change and an internal gear doesn't give you that kind of fine tuning which doesn't seem as necessary when you're just going to work and back or going to the library grabbing a coffee doing errands which is sort of most of what you do on a city bike but an internal gear will give you the range you need so you can buy internal gears and a three-speed variation which is good for flat terrain a seven-speed vari variation which is getting better for hilly terrain eight-speed variation which has almost the same gear range as a 27 speed derailleur system and all the way up to a 14 speed uh, system which actually has more gear range than any derailleur system on the market other real cool thing about internal gear hubs is you can shift when standing still so everyone knows what it's like to get to a stoplight and you're in your hardest gear and now imagine you're on a hill too you've got to press down on that pedal really really hard just to be able to shift into an easier gear when the light turns green but on an internal gear hub, you can simply just notice that you're on hard gear and without pedaling at all, shift it to the easy gear. And once the light turns green, you're on your way. Another little bonus with most internal gear hubs is that they use a grip shifter. And that means that it's just a lot easier to shift if you're wearing kind of clunky mitts or thick gloves. The other big mechanism on a bike are the brakes, which of course stop you. And that's going to become increasingly important, especially as the weather gets more and more foul. We want to have brakes that can handle icy and snowy conditions. So there's many kind of brakes out there on the market, but they can really be divided into three camps. The first kind of brakes are rim brakes. So they press against the rim and that friction is what stops you. Now, the problem with rim brakes in the winter, especially, or actually any weather that involves rain or moisture, is that you can roll through a puddle and now the rim is wet. And what that means is that the brake, instead of stopping you, is actually wiping off the water that you just rolled through and will only begin to break once the rim surface dries. And what that means for winter cycling is a lack of consistency. Because if you think about what brakes offer, well, they offer safety. And safety fundamentally involves having a consistent feel. So if your brakes are constantly changing their consistency, that's not as safe. The other kind of brake is what we call drum brakes. And they tend to be really common on a lot of European bikes. They're on the heavier side, but just like the internal gear hub, they are 100% sealed inside the hub, just like the internal gears inside the hub. So these brakes are completely sealed, which is a huge plus. Now they do tend to be on the heavy side, which doesn't matter so much if you're a city cyclist, you're only going to work, but they're super low maintenance and very, very powerful. So the third type of brake we're gonna talk about is disc brakes. While rim brakes and disc brakes are both external, disc brakes sit about a foot and a half off the wheel, which means that if you ride through a puddle, they don't get wet. And that means you get the same sort of braking consistency that you get from a drum brake, but the difference is that a disc brake has way more power. Now, an important thing to add about disc brakes is that they generally come in two different varieties. There's a cable actuated one and a hydraulic one. And since we're talking about winter cycling, the hydraulic one is really quite a bonus. The bonus here is that hydraulic fluid can't freeze. When you wake up in the morning, you go to ride your bike to work, you know that you're going to be safe because your brakes are in working order, no matter what the weather. So now we talked about the difference between a cycling commuter in North America, who often wears this sort of spandex superhero outfit, and the European cyclist who wears their woolen coat, and woolen gloves, and makes it look fashionable. Now, why can the European cyclist do this? One of the biggest reasons for that is tied to the drivetrain. Now, we've talked about how gears can be internal, and maybe we should ask the same thing about the bicycle chain itself. Maybe the chain should be under wraps. After all, the chain is the dirtiest part of your bicycle and is sitting there right next to your clothes. I mean, most people who ride North American cyclists are always trying to keep oil off their clothes. They're wearing their office clothes or on their way to work and they get there and there's this big greasy tattoo right on their khakis. Now, almost every single bicycle in Europe comes with some sort of drivetrain protection and that protections there not necessarily to keep the chain clean as much as it's there to keep your clothing clean. And there's two different types of drivetrain protection. One is a very old technology and it's just called the chain cover. This has been around for ages. We carry Dutch bikes, which use this ancient vinyl cover. Sometimes they use a plastic cover, uh, but basically in essence, the idea of a chain cover is that the chain is under wraps. Now, minimally, you want to have a chain guard that will protect your clothing. That way you can arrive to the office without that chain grease tattoo. Now, a chain case that protects both your clothing and a chain is ideal. And the reason for that is that winter does produce a lot of slush and salt and gets that chain kind of filthy. So even if your clothes are clean, your chain is getting dirtier by the minute. A good example of an aftermarket chain case is the Hebe chain glider, which fits on most bikes that have either a single speed or internal gear hub. Note that chain cases do not work on derailleur equipped bikes because the chain is going back and forth and it's really hard to create a case that covers a sort of lateral movement. 
Now, the other technology, and this is relatively new, is called a belt drive. Now, belt drives are external, but because they run completely clean, free of oil, free of any sort of grease, they work to the same capacity that a full chain case does. Now, the cool thing about a belt drive is that it runs for a lot longer than a chain. We're talking anywhere from 30 to 60,000 kilometers, which is a huge improvement over a chain, which maybe runs 4,000 to 5,000 kilometers if you're lucky. So now we've mentioned that we import European bikes and we want to import European cycling culture. But one of the big differences between a European bike and a North American bike is that a European bike, if it's going to be used in the city, must be sold with a light scent. So if a bike is transportation, just like a car is transportation, you would expect a bike to come with lights. But in North America, most bikes don't come with lights. You have to put a light set onto the bike, which is usually a clip-on variety, which means when you forget to clip it off, when you park to go into work or to the grocery store, someone will clip it off for you. Bike light theft is a constant problem. Now, most clip-on bike lights don't really offer much in the way of a beam. They're just there to sort of say, hey, here I am. So now imagine a light set that doesn't require batteries, casts a beam, allows you to be seen, and is completely theft resistant. Now this is called the Dynamo Light, and it's available on pretty much all of the European bikes that we import. Throughout this video, we've talked a lot about gears and brakes that are sealed inside of the hubs. Well, that's also the case for a Dynamo Hub. So a Dynamo Hub is in the front wheel, and inside the hub is a series of magnets that produce electricity and power your light set. Now the great thing about these light sets is that they're bolted onto the bike. Their front light is bolted onto the fork of your bicycle, and the rear light either to your seat post or to your bicycle rack. So that means two things so far. One, your lights can't get stolen. They're bolted to the bike. They're just as much part of your bike as any other part. Two, with the Dynamo producing its own electricity, you don't need batteries anymore. So one of the bonus items that most Dynamo systems have is a stand light. And a stand light means that the light inside has a capacitor. Now that capacitor stores energy as you're riding, which means if you've ridden for about 10 minutes, it stores 10 minutes of charge. That means when you hit a red light, the lights stay on and they'll stay on for at least another five to 10 minutes. Having lights that, that stays on when you stop at a stoplight is also theft proof and doesn't rely on batteries. That's really smart thinking. That really makes sense for most city bikes. And we can add a dynamo light to an existing bike, or you can buy a bike that has a dynamo system on it. That's something we specialize in. Now, just like you need good snow boots in the winter and you need good gloves, your bike actually needs those things too. So let us jump into what we mean by that. So when it comes to winter cycling, you'll want to change your tires, just like you would on a car. And there's two options for winter tires. The first tire privilege is the kind of cyclist who rides no matter what the weather conditions are. There's a type of winter cyclist out there that's sort of hardcore. This is a person who wants to ride no matter the piles of snow on the ground, the sheets of ice. They're out there to do it because it's there. That sort of hardcore winter cyclist needs a studded tire. A studded tire is designed for black ice, whether that's on the surface or underneath snow. It's there to grip the ice with absolute certainty. You've got metal studs gripping into the ice and there's no chance you're gonna fall over. Now, the problem with studs is that if you have a winter like we often have in Toronto, where there's not that much snowfall, really if you were to ride on snowy days and be maybe 12 days a year that means you're riding the aesthetic tires on raw pavement for most of the time and it creates a lot of noise it also causes a lot of flat tires because no matter how you cut it steel is always harder than rubber and it's going to find its way through the tire and hit the inner tube causing punctures now the other kind of winter cyclist out there is the one we'll call the rational winter cyclist and this is the kind of cyclist you see in europe a lot this is the kind of cyclist who has no problem taking an Uber or a taxi or maybe transit the day that it's really heavily snowing, but for the rest of the year, and that's most of the year, they're still out there riding. Now, that cyclist still needs a different kind of tire on their bike. And the reason for that is that you might hit a small patch of black ice or you just want that extra grip. It's just there to protect you. Now, this tire won't have metal studs inside of it. Instead, it uses the same kind of technology you'd see on a car tire. And car tires have two basic technologies. One, the tire compound is a lot softer. We call it a durometer. And that means it's just a lot stickier on the ground. Now, the other technology this tire has is what they call microsiping. Now, microsiping means that you have really, really small treads, not microscopic, but really small. 
and these treads create suction on ice. And a lot of people like to think that the more like mountain bike kind of treads they have on their tires, like these big thick lugs, it's gonna create more traction on ice. That's not the case. It's actually the smaller the tread, the more suction is created. So those two features, a softer durometer, a softer compound, and that microsiping sort of suction-like tread, it's just basically two tire changes a year, and now you're a winter cyclist. Now, the other absolutely essential thing that we recommend for any winter cyclist is what they call pogies. Now, pogies are a really, really clever invention. First, they keep your hands warm. And second, they actually keep the mechanisms on your handlebars sealed, which means no more frozen gears and no more frozen brakes. Now, if you go to most bike stores, you can buy winter gloves that cost, you know, $300 and upwards. And when you use pogies, you really don't need those anymore. The cool thing about pogies is that once you have them under handlebars, you can wear a lightweight winter glove for most of the winter. That means you could probably just use the gloves you already have, like your woolen gloves, instead of buying a fancy sort of purpose-built cycling glove. Most pogies on the market are windproof. They're also highly insulated. They keep your hands warm, no matter what the weather. Now, the other great thing about pogies is that they're great for your bicycle and for the bicycle mechanic who fixes your bike. So what pogies do is they cover up the gears and brakes on your handlebars. And that prevents water from getting inside of them, which means that you can brake all year round and shift all year round as well. And you might ask, Ooh, are pogies a, a, easy to steal? And the answer is no, they're not. They actually bolt to your bicycle and are theft resistant, just like any other part. Now, the one thing you should do if you're a winter cyclist is just keep your bike clean. And I know that's hard to do when you finish a day of work and you're going to park your bike into a cold garage, but it's really, really essential. And there's really easy ways to do this. You can just buy a big sponge and some, get some hot water and just sort of wipe down the bottom of the bike, which is where a lot of the salt will accumulate. And it's really that salt that you're trying to get off of the bike. It can get its way into parts. It can cause all sorts of mayhem. So like we said, winter cycling is amazing. A lot of people will spend their spring and summer outside enjoying it, but close themselves into cars and their office and their houses all winter. But here's this chance to get out of the gridlock, explore your world, save money, keep your health up, and feel amazing. Thanks for watching. If you wanna watch more of our amazing videos, you can just click that subscribe button down below. Keep riding.